Uh, before we begin, let me check uh, the system. Uh, do you all hear me uh, clear and loud? Good morning. Okay, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the inaugural uh, Kimse and MBA Roundtable seminar, the one we have today. Uh, I'm a retired Captain Navy Jung from Rang Navy, and also the welcome to uh, this, this uh, the virtual webinar to all of you. Uh, due to the time limit we have, uh, I need to save even a few minutes. So before I start, uh, let me make just two announcements. Uh, one is that uh, the, today's uh, audiences cannot use the video function and uh, the audio function. They can, they can hear only. And also the other, another announcement is that uh, for Korean audiences, they can use the interpretation function button uh, below in your screen. So if they hear in Korean, please use the function. Okay, uh, let me, let me uh, start inviting the Kim's Chairman Jung uh, for delivering open remarks. Chairman Jung, it's yours. Welcome everyone on board the first uh, NBR Teams uh, Roundtable, webinar Roundtable. Good morning participants in Korea and good evening participants in Washington DC. First of all, I would like to thank all participants of Teams and NBR for investing time and effort to make this program realized. It is our pleasure to establish a new relationship with NBR, a prominent think tank in the United States specializing in Asian studies. Kim's Korea Institute for Maritime Strategy is a think tank having main purpose and focus to promote order and peace in the East Asia. We especially value the cooperation with NBR since we have largely similar objectives towards peace and prosperity of the region. Today, uh, we will discuss current maritime security environment in East Asia to draw out implications for the US and Iraq Navy. Currently, we are experiencing some tumultuous challenges in the region and it is our task to devise appropriate countermeasures against activities that could possibly threaten the international order in the region. I would like to express my special thanks to Mr. Roy Kenhausen for co-hosting this event, Mr. Michael Wies for moderating this round table and all distinguished panelists for their valuable opinion. Again, many thanks to you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chairman Chung. Um, I want to ask the uh, notice. For audiences, uh, you can use the only q and box where you can, uh, the questions you like to raise. Now time to over to the, the moderator, Mr. Williams, uh, who will uh, the lead of state discussion, please, it's yours. Well, thank you very much, Director Chung and Chairman Chung. It's our pleasure to collaborate with Kim's on this uh, important event, and we look forward to, to a long partnership with you. Uh, we fully agree that this set of issues on maritime security are critically important for US interests in the region and for the US ROK Alliance. And so we're delighted today to have four expert speakers, uh, two from the United States and two from Korea, to dig into these questions a little bit and to offer their remarks. I'm going to briefly introduce the four of them, um, and then we'll have them speak for, uh, for about 10 minutes apiece. Uh, and during their, their, during their presentations, please feel free to, um, to send your questions to the, the, the hosts of the, of the webinar. Uh, they will feed those to me and then I will incorporate them into the questions that I ask the panelists during our roundtable discussion. So our first presenter today is uh, Professor Kim Sung Han from 
Korea University. He's a professor of international relations in the Graduate School of International Studies, um, also the director of Ilmen International Relations Institute, and previously served as Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade from 2012 to 2013. And he will speak uh, to begin with on US-China maritime strategic competition and how that affects the US-ROK alliance. We'll then move to my colleague, uh, Alison Solwinski. Uh, she is the Vice President for Research um, here at NBR based in our Washington DC office. Uh, she runs all of NBR's research programs and I've had the pleasure of working with her as a co-editor on NBR's annual Strategic Asia program for several years now. And Allison will be talking about the US free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and specifically for its implications in the waters around the Korean Peninsula. Third, we will go to Professor Park Wong Gong. Uh, he is a professor in the Department of North Korean Studies at Ihua Women's University in Seoul. Uh, previously has worked at Handong Global University and the Korea Institute for Defense Analyses. And uh, Professor Park will look at North Korea's maritime challenge and how that affects the US ROK alliance. And then last but not least, we will go to Terence Rorig, who is the Professor of National Security Affairs at the US Naval War College up at Newport in Rhode Island. Um, he's also affiliated with Harvard University and Columbia University. And he will be wrapping up our four panelists with a, a presentation on US ROC maritime cooperation beyond the Korean Peninsula. So with that, I'd like to turn to Professor Kim to begin with his remarks. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Kim uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity uh, to share my views. Let me start by briefly uh, talking about uh, US-China strategic competition. Uh, if I may, the United States is implementing uh, so-called 21st century type of uh, containment uh, policy uh, on China. Uh, of course, it is different from the Cold War type of uh, uh, containment, but uh, it is hard to say uh, whether uh, it is really successful or not. Uh, anyhow, uh, 21st century type of uh, US uh, containment uh, consists of, uh, first of all, uh, strengthening uh, military deterrence uh, based on uh, military innovation and uh, alliance network. Uh, secondly, uh, restructuring uh, global value chain. And thirdly, uh, utilizing uh, multilateral efforts. Uh, hard uh, containment uh, policy uh, seems to be uh, making a progress, but uh, it depends on uh, how far uh, US allies uh, can cooperate. On the other hand, uh, the soft uh, containment, uh, which is rather uh, focused on uh, economy, is unlikely to be a successful uh, because US allies and, and partners are unwilling to cut off uh, their economic ties with uh, China. Uh, allies like ROK would try to uh, join uh, so-called high-tech uh, cooperation with the United States while maintaining and, and diversifying uh, trade and investment uh, with China. On the other hand, uh, China was uh, expected to uh, push uh, BRI, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, further uh, to contain uh, US containment strategy so that uh, China uh, may reduce the number of countries who might join uh, US uh, strategy, but uh, it is now uh, rather relying upon uh, so-called uh, dual uh, circulation uh, strategy, uh, domestic, uh, international kind of uh, uh, mixed uh, uh, circulation uh, strategy, uh, rather than solely uh, relying on uh, overseas trade and investment uh, kind of things. Anyway, if you look at the BRI and uh, the US uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, the overlap area uh, is the land and sea of uh, Southeast uh, Asia, uh, including uh, South China Sea. So that's why uh, this uh, competition uh, is rather uh, concentrated on uh, fierce uh, competition uh, on uh, the Western uh, Pacific uh, area uh, for the sake of uh, maintaining uh, its uh, hegemonic status on the US part and uh, uh, challenging or contesting 
uh, the U.S. status uh, from the Chinese uh, side. Against this backdrop, kind of a new strategic concept, uh, so-called integrated uh, deterrence, uh, is getting uh, kind of uh, gaining a, a special uh, attention. Uh, because U.S. Defense Secretary uh, Lloyd Austin uh, mentioned this concept uh, May uh, this year. Integrated uh, deterrence means that the Pentagon uh, will not uh, rely on uh, U.S. military uh, strengths alone uh, to prevent uh, adversaries from attacking uh, because adversaries are pressing for uh, advantage uh, in multiple uh, domains. So uh, Pentagon uh, appears to be looking for a, a different approach uh, that requires a deeper uh, integration with allies, partners, and other uh, instruments of uh, uh, national uh, power. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, GPR, the DOD uh, announced Monday uh, the completion of uh, its global posture review, uh, which offers a few changes in force laid down uh, and includes a serious, uh, series of uh, previously announced uh, troop uh, movements. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, GPR directs uh, additional uh, cooperation with allies and partners uh, to advance uh, initiatives uh, and uh, uh, you know, initiatives that contribute to uh, regional stability and deter uh, potential uh, Chinese uh, military uh, kind of uh, advancement uh, and threats uh, from uh, China as well as uh, North Korea. Uh, these initiatives include uh, seeking uh, greater uh, regional access uh, for military partnership uh, kind of activities, uh, enhancing uh, infrastructure in Australia and the Pacific Islands, and uh, planning uh, rotational uh, aircraft uh, deployment, uh, deployments in Australia. Uh, GPR also uh, informed uh, Secretary Austin's approval of the permanent uh, stationing of a previously rotational uh, attack helicopter uh, squadron uh, and artillery uh, division headquarters in the Republic of Korea, uh, which signifies an agreement on uh, the mutual uh, importance of uh, Iraq-US uh, military alliance. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, um, and, and thank you for uh, concise remarks, but also getting a lot of good content on the on the table. Let me ask you one quick follow up before we go to, to Alison Solinsky. Um, from your perspective, um, do you see stuff that is encouraging in the in the global posture review? Do you think it went far enough? Um, how does how does the, the security establishment in Seoul look at what's coming out of the Pentagon and, and does it see it as as the right level of, of sort of um, request coming toward US allies and partners in the region? Uh, quite frankly, uh, we, uh, the, the, the security community of ROK uh, have been a, a little bit concerned about uh, the final outcome of GPR, but uh, quite frankly, again, uh, we are uh, satisfied uh, with uh, the final uh, outcome because uh, it has not uh, come up with uh, drastic changes. Uh, rather, it is focused on the status quo. And, and also, uh, as I mentioned in the last part, uh, you know, the, 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 the rotational the attack helicopter squadron and, and uh, some uh, you know, the artillery division headquarters, uh, it is no longer rotational. It is kind of a permanent, uh, which signifies uh, further commitment on the part of the United States. That's really good. Great. Thank you very much. Alison, let's turn to you and uh, sort of get your views on, on how the US is approaching its free and open Indo-Pacific strategy in the region. Thanks so much, Michael. And uh, thanks to Kim's for uh, inviting me to speak and uh, cooperating and collaborating with NBR on this event. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody. So as uh, Michael noted, I've been asked to focus on the U.S. ROK Alliance in a little bit of the broader regional context with that emphasis on uh, the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and how the ROK fits in with that strategy. Um, and the role of the U.S. ROK Alliance in the region is a really critical one for us to assess. 
particularly since there seems to be a, a lack of mutual understanding between the US and ROK about how the alliance fits into the wider regional framework. And that is one uh, framework which is increasingly being shaped by US-China competition. So I'll start first with a little bit of an overview on the Indo-Pacific strategy and the initial ROK response to it, um, and then touch on how that response has evolved and what the potential opportunities for cooperation for the US and Korea in the region might be going forward. So the, the Trump administration announced its version of an Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, then called the Free and Open Indo-Pacific uh, in 2017. And then it continued to add detail and definition to it in the subsequent years. And that strategy seeks to uphold a region in which all nations are secure in their sovereignty and able to pursue economic growth consistent with international law and principles of fair competition, which includes an emphasis on uh, freedom of navigation and maritime security. And so alongside the US's development of the strategy, many US allies and partners in the region uh, put forth their own versions, um, including the Quad members, so that's Japan, Australia, and India, um, as well as ASEAN. Noticeably absent from this list of regional actors is the Republic of Korea, which uh, from the outset has maintained a particular allergy to publicly signing on to anything with a, a free and open Indo-Pacific label. When the US first began to promote its Indo-Pacific strategy in the region, uh, Korean counterparts were careful to support some of the individual framework ideas and note that there might be areas where the US strategy and the ROK's own new Southern policy shared interests. Um, but that was without committing support to the strategy itself or aligning with particular uh, Indo-Pacific strategy initiatives. And so there are a few different factors that have played into this. First, um, and probably least significantly, uh, initially, the ROK seemed a little bit reluctant to join on the bandwagon of what other regional nations uh, were announcing and the new Pacific strategy, in, in part because the concept was first put forth by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2016. So Japan was really putting itself forward as a leader on this and other regional initiatives like CPTPP, which made some in Seoul hesitant to join what was being cast or perceived as a Japanese-led coalition. Second, uh, the, ROK, the US ROK alliance at that time uh, was under some significant strain as the Trump administration was employing blunt, uh, less than friendly language to question the value of the alliance um, and pressuring Seoul to contribute more in burden sharing negotiations and at times uh, putting forth a North Korea policy that was at best uncoordinated with Seoul and at worst direct odds with what the Moon administration was pursuing. But third and most importantly and most enduring is uh, the Korea's desire to avoid joining a strategy that is driven by the geo geopolitical competition between the US and China and which China perceives to be about limiting its rising power. In the face of growing US-China rivalry, while some states in the region have aligned more closely with the US, such as Japan and Australia, the ROK has so far adopted a policy of remaining indecisive in its relations with the US and China, and has done so in large part to avoid the potential unacceptable costs associated with choosing between the two rivals. But despite the uh, uh, ROK's hesitation to fully endorse the US Indo-Pacific strategy, both nations have noted and publicly emphasized the areas of overlap and synergy between the Indo-Pacific strategy and the ROK's new Southern policy. In August of 2020, the US and Korea launched a working level US ROK Indo-Pacific strategy, new Southern policy dialogue, really catchy name, with the objective of creating a safe, prosperous and dynamic Indo-Pacific region through cooperation between the ROK's new Southern policy and the US's Indo-Pacific strategy based on the principles of openness, inclusiveness, transparency, respect for international norms and ASEAN centrality. And in particular, during these discussions and elsewhere, Washington and Seoul have identified areas 
under all three of the NSP pillars for collaboration. Um, so that includes the prosperity pillar, which has focus on energy, infrastructure and development, and the digital economy. Uh, the people pillar focused on civil society. And then third is the peace pillar um, focused on mainly capacity building in non-traditional security areas, which includes uh, discussions that the nations have had on maritime law enforcement, uh, marine environmental protection, and natural disaster response. So these consultations have made some progress in aligning elements of these three pillars. However, the core strategic issues of the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy remain largely untouched as Seoul continues to navigate that balance between contributing to U.S. initiatives without committing to issues that will anger China. Additionally, uh, Korea has thus far structured its engagement with the Indo-Pacific strategy on uh, mostly just a bilateral basis. Uh, it's declined to coordinate further with the other countries' uh, Indo-Pacific versions, such as uh, ASEAN's outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Now, since the Biden administration has taken office, uh, many aspects of the Trump administration's free and open Indo-Pacific strategy have been reaffirmed, including the centrality of strategic competition with China and uh, an added extra emphasis on alliances and partnerships. As of yet, uh, this administration has not published or fully articulated what is uh, involved or how it will be implemented its own Indo-Pacific strategy, but uh, it seems thus far that the renewed focus on strengthening relationships with allies has borne some fruit in kind of moving the ROK somewhat closer to cooperation on the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. At the um, recent May uh, Moon Biden summit, the joint statement that was released uh, was notable for including the specific language that the U.S. uses in its Indo-Pacific narratives without modification. It also stated that uh, the significance of the U.S. ROK relationship extends far beyond the Korean Peninsula, and therefore acknowledging that the alliance has a broader role to play in the region. And while the Moon administration continues uh, its policy of strategic non-decision in the broader U.S.-China competition, over time we've seen it inch closer to stronger support for the Indo-Pacific strategy. So despite this progress, despite this step forward um, recently in those uh, bilateral discussions, there does remain a wide range of issues and ways that the US ROK Alliance can better contribute to regional peace and stability. As a middle power, the ROK can further its support for multilateralism by expanding its cooperation on other regional countries' Indo-Pacific strategies, um, particularly the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. ASEAN's AOIP uh, may also offer Korea an example of one way to navigate the balance of addressing cooperative security issues as, it, uh, as uh, this, this policy, this strategy emphasizes maritime cooperation in one area of concern for ASEAN, while at the same time kind of skirting strategic confrontation with China. And finally, for the US ROK Alliance, um, although they remain sensitive to address, uh, it will be critical that the unresolved questions about the role of the Security Alliance in the broader region begin to be raised and explored, uh, and that can be done within the context of the Indo-Pacific strategy. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Ali. Um, I just want to, to ask you one quick question before we move to Dr. Park. Um, there's a lot of overlap between what you've just said and what uh, Professor Kim began uh, today's session with. Um, but he used the word containment to describe the US policy toward China. Um, as someone based in DC, is that how uh, Washington is, is viewing its, its approach toward China? It's, I'm just curious if you could unpack that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the US administration uh, consistently across uh, the Obama, Trump, Biden administrations have been very careful to not use the term containment. Uh, and I think that it's very important uh, in relationship with its 
with its allies and partners in particular uh, that the administration, the US administration offer a constructive approach to what it's trying to achieve within its Indo-Pacific strategy that is not just about uh, containment of China, but rather offering uh, a set of values and norms and security and stability that many different types, many different types of governments, different cultures, different uh, countries can find uh, areas of overlap and shared interests and uh, join and contribute to uh, to defining that strategy and, and reaching that vision. So um, while uh, certainly is China's preferred language to say that uh, these Indo-Pacific strategies and regional uh, multilateral groupings such as the Quad are uh, targeted and geared towards containing China, I think that uh, that the US and some of its partners in the region have gone to pains to explain how they are bigger and broader than just a containment strategy. Thank you very much. Um, okay, let's move from this wider regional view. We sort of discussed the, the, the alliance and the, the maritime dimensions of the alliance in the context of these big strategic issues across the region and, and the competition between the United States and China. Obviously, from, from South Korea's perspective, there's a very prominent uh, maritime security challenge coming just from the north. And so, Professor Park, let me turn to you now and, and ask you to make your remarks. Thank you for inviting me to this very meaningful seminar. And yeah, thank you for the Korea Institute for Maritime Strategy. And also thank you for the National Bureau of Asian Research. And you are right. And North Korean threat is a very imminent and a very real challenge to the South Korean uh, security, but not only South Korea, but North Korea has uh, developed their nuclear missiles and range about the, uh, of course, it can include the Japan also, um, it's allegedly known that they have a, a capability to attack the mainland the United States. So I don't think uh, it's the original issue, but it's a global issue too. And also in terms of the non-proliferation, of course, North Korea's nuclear development is a huge challenge to MPT. Okay, uh, I've been told that I have need to talk about the North Koreans' uh, intention and their, their very current situation and why they you know, still develop these very advanced the nuclear weapons and including the missiles. So I'm going to talk about the current situation first and then um, I think uh, you already know very well that North Korea has resumed the missile test in very diversity and SLBM submarine launched ballistic missiles and hypersonic missiles and cruise missiles and this kind of type of ballistic missiles and since the May 2019 until very recently a couple of months ago. And about why, why then why, why North Korea? What's the North Korea's intention and motivation, uh, especially to uh, continue to develop this more advanced weapon? I think um, they make it very clear that they are going to continue to so-called uh, the line is a policy direction or a strategic direction. They introduced this line um, in the December 2019 in the uh, their fifth plenary meeting of seventh century committee. That is a frontal breakthrough line, a little bit weird. Yes, uh, it's uh, translated in from Korean to English and uh, more appropriate uh, translation is would be a, a frontal, not the frontal, but head-on breakthrough line. But since North Korea, they use this word of frontal breakthrough line, I'm gonna use that one. In Korean is 정면 돌파 노선. Okay, uh, the line's goal is break the, breaking down the US sanction blockade scheme. And uh, it is understandable, of course, from the North Korean perspective. After breakdown of the Hanoi summit in February 2019 and the final working level talk in October 2019, North Korea has introduced this new line and this very aggressive policy and confrontational policy against United States. And they are you know, very clearly mentioning that no more dialogue with the United States unless United States withdraw this hostile policy first. And then our uh, eighth party Congress this year, January 2021, and simply they confirmed, I mean, North Korea has confirmed to continue to have uh, this frontal breakthrough line by being an advanced nuclear powers. And Kim Jong-un himself mentioning in his opening remarks and his intention to continue this uh, frontal breakthrough line. And also uh, North Korea uh, in, at, at the seventh, uh, eighth uh, party Congress in January, 
delivers a very specific message to the United States. So of course, that's very hardline policy. And first, they introduced to their intention to advance its nuclear capability to the highest level. And I think uh, their main objective to do that is to be recognized as de facto nuclear weapon state. And Kim Jong-un himself in the, the Eighth Party Congress mentioned that, quote, North Korea is a nuclear weapon state and will press ahead uninterrupted with the already started building of a nuclear force for the welfare of the people, end quote. And very clearly saying that they are the nuclear weapon uh, state. And also uh, they are showing a very interesting list. I, I, I call it as like a nuclear portfolio. This include everything, start with the super large ML, uh, MLRS, multiple launch uh, rocket system, new tactical nuclear missiles, intermediate range cruise missiles, multi-warhead rocket, and hypersonic gliding fight warheads, and new nuclear powered submarine and the military reconnaissance satellite. It seems to me uh, their main purpose to introduce this uh, list of the uh, very top notch uh, weapons is to press the United States to have a nuclear arms talk. So North Korea is uh, showing their intention that they no longer wanted to talk about denuclearization talk, rather they wanted to uh, talk of the arms uh, reduction talk as a de facto nuclear weapon state status. And Kim Jong-un himself is clearly showing it, it, this kind of intention quote. He said that uh, stressing that the strong defense capability of the state never precludes diplomacy, but serves as a powerful means to propel it along the right course and uh, guarantees success. So it's very clearly saying, saying that he has every intention to develop this uh, very high uh, quality uh, nuclear weapons. And the problem is that I just mentioned like multi warhead rocket and hypersonic gliding flight warhead, and even a nuclear powered submarine. This is top notch weapons that North Korea may be unable to develop, and I'm pretty much doubt about that. And also, this is a very extremely, you know, expensive weaponry. So I think, um, you know, it, it, it is kind of reasonable way to think that the North Korea is better to have a few strategic weapons in terms of cost benefit calculation in this very dire economic situation. So I think. Uh, this is their very clear message to the United States that, that, that time is their side, unless the United States stop us. And I have to talk about the tactical nuclear weapons. And Kim Jong-un himself, at once one more time, the 8th Party Congress in January said that uh, he's ordered to develop the tactical nuclear weapons. And now uh, we are seeing this kind of weapons uh, lately and um, this is a very serious challenge and near-term threat because they do have a, a reliability, effectiveness, and survivability. And also they do have a so-called dual capable system to carry out both conventional and nuclear payload. And um, one of these, uh, some example, one of these some missiles is KN-23, and that is North Korean version of Russian Iskander missile. And they do have a so-called pull-up maneuver to complicate the ability to ground-based interceptor to destroy. And they have a flight range up to 100,000 kilometers. And also KN-24 is similar to the United States ATACIMS multi-rocket launchers. They have a mobile launchers and solid fear and relatively large payload. And so I think it's a very uh, daunting challenge and extreme threat to the Korean Peninsula and threat to the Japan as well. And also a uh, problem is that this is a practically impossible to detect whether they have a tactical missile load, um, tactical missile load nuclear or conventional warhead. And also the current missile defense system do not work. I mean, you cannot uh, hit the, these missiles. So I think it's kind of a game changer in terms of this uh, theater of the, uh, here on the Korean Peninsula. Then what should we do? Okay, US alliance and extended deterrence. And right now in Korea, including me, and many are concerned about the credibility of the United States extended deterrence, at least for um, two reasons. First, the extended deterrence itself. It is just a commitment, not fully institutionalized. 
The United States has never shared its decision-making process of the use of a nuclear weapon. And of course, I understand that it solely belongs to the United States president uh, by the United States law. And for example, NATO, they do have a nuclear planning group, so-called NPT. It's not the decision body, but to concerting mechanism. Then uh, extended deterrence for South Korea. Of course, uh, South Korea and United States has many concerting mechanisms, such as Korea-US Integrate Defense Dialogue, also known as KIT, and that they met, uh, have met uh, twice a year. Also, ROK-US has a Deterrence Strategic Committee, DSC. This is another concerting body to focus on extended de deterrence, but they do have some achievement. But overall, it just talks about the basic concept not to develop making joint nuclear operational plan. The US never share its uh, detailed plan for deploying strategic asset and the operational plan for nuclear war. So I'm, nowadays I also see the, some worry, some uh, you know, kind of a, a signs that are okay, US joint military exercise, especially exercise to deploying the US strategic asset to Korean Peninsula simply stopped. So it's definitely weakened the extended deterrence and because the deployment of a strategic asset is an essential part of extended deterrence. Second reason that we have a great doubt about the United States extended deterrence is so-called Trumpism. And we experienced the last four years how Trump undermined this whole ROK the alliance, including, of course, the alliance with South Korea. And that he definitely see the alliance in a transactional way and cost benefit calculation and frequently mentioning about denying security commitment. And so even the Trump himself very clearly mentioned that ROK US joint military exercise as a war game, provocative and very expensive. So we have uh, some, uh, you know, worrisome. So th th then, then what is South Korea's choice? Right now we are talking a lot about this extended deterrence. We do have a uh, two choice. First, institutionalized and extended deterrence further. It has a clear limit, uh, clear uh, limit though. And um, that is one the choice that we can make. And second choice is bringing the United States tactical nuclear weapon and even preparing for nuclear armament. Of course, I oppose the second choice, but if uh, we no longer, you know, been uh, uh, account for, account, yeah, no longer we can, uh, believe in this United States uh, security guarantee by the extent deterrence, but then we don't have any choice. Okay, thank you. I'm going to stop here. Thanks, Professor Park. You certainly got some uh, uh, provocative uh, ideas on the table, which is, is always good for a discussion like this. Let me ask you one quick follow up question before we go to our last speaker. Um, I, I certainly agree with you that there's been um, uh, Sort of a diminution of, of the, the US ROK uh, uh, war games and sort of military exercise preparations on the peninsula. Um, part of my understanding of that is that, that was those were decisions made at a political level in the context of ROK DPRK efforts to uh, to sort of move towards some form of reconciliation, which was obviously a Moon administration priority. And, and during the Trump administration, clearly sort of played into to, to some of the goals that, that President Trump had at the time. Um, I'm thinking back to, um, to your initial description of this massive increase in, in North Korean um, sort of missile tests and, and, and the use of the waters around the peninsula uh, to, to showcase some of these new, very offensive technologies. What does that mean for the, the maritime peace zone that was, uh, was contained in the comprehensive military agreement in 2018 between the DPRK and the ROK? Do you think there's, there's still prospects for that kind of, of impetus from the South Korean side? To engage the North, or are you seeing enough trends from what the North is doing that really preclude that kind of reconciliation approach, um, given some of the the, the 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 developments we've seen in the last couple of years? All right, um, you ask actually. Uh, it seems to me two questions about the United States uh, perception about this uh, joint military exercise. Of course, I don't like the word the "war game" because that's the one used by the North Korea. This joint military exercise of United States and South Korea is a hundred percent of the defensive purpose. We don't have any plan to preemptively or preventively attack the North Korea. So it's a defensive of the joint military exercise period. 
Um, the, of course, uh, we have been undermined this uh, joint military exercise because of this political decision. And uh, Michael, you are right. And in order to continue or in order to bring the North Korea into the negotiation table, of course, North Korea is uh, very sensitive about the joint military exercise. So we are the so-called scaling down, and we sometimes stop this uh, joint military exercise. But problem is that at this moment, year 2021, even uh, the year 2019, after break of the Hanoi and the May of that year, North Korea has continued uh, just to resume their missile test, KN-23, 24, 25, even KN-30. And it's a huge challenge to the South Korean security. But still, we, I mean, South Korea and United States haven't had any full scale of the joint military exercise. I understand about that because of the COVID-19 situation. But still, South Korean government is uh, thinking, uh, you know, bringing the, some kind of political, the. Uh, kind of, a, you know, the interest or political calculation <clears throat> not to provoke North Korea, but it's uh, definitely undermine the readiness to the North Koreans to enhance the uh, nuclear missiles. And second question is maritime DPRK, ROK. And we do have uh, this uh, a little bit, the, uh, you know, enhanced kind of an agreement between the two Koreas in year 2019, the September, the called uh, September 9th uh, military agreement. And then it's, uh, you know, how to interpret this military argument. Some people are saying that already this is uh, agreement abandoned by the North Korea because they violated at least three times. But at the same time, it is true that at least uh, for after year 2018, we haven't had to see any kind of a serious uh, localized provocation between these two Koreas. So some people are saying that it works. So we will see, but it's a very controversial one too. Thank you very much, Professor Pat. Okay, let's move to Terry Rorig, our last presenter of the day, and uh, have him uh, wrap up the presentation. We're going to broaden the lens back out a little bit away from the peninsula and look more broadly at um, US ROK maritime cooperation uh, in the wider region. Terry, over to you. Thank you very much, and, and thanks to Kim's and to NBR for the opportunity to be part of this, this great uh, event. Um, I also have to say that these are my own, my own personal views and not those of my uh, employer, the US Navy and, and such. Um, I'm, I'm going to sort of follow on a, a, a great presentation that, that Ali made in regards to the broader um, US ROC uh, cooperation and, and the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy, et cetera, and look at some specifics. In particular, I wanna talk a little more about the Quad and then also about Taiwan and what implications that may have for the alliance. So as was laid out already that, that uh, the Quad has been a difficult and, and interesting debate in South Korea over the degree to which South Korea should participate in some sort of Quad Plus that might follow um, or not at all, or is there some sort of sweet spot in the middle where it's not formally joining but is able to participate in some of the different activities and issues that do fit very well with South Korea's interests. And I think um, there are a number that are very um, consistent with South Korea's interests. And so just to, to focus on the emphasis on the free and open Indo-Pacific and the rules-based international order that the, uh, the quad and, and broader elements focus on, South Korea clearly has a stake in that, given its uh, dependence on, on as an export dependent economy, having peace and stability in the maritime zone is essential for South Korea. And so has a has very important interest in that regard. But how can it do that and participate in some of those elements with at least the cautious approach that it is undertaking at this particular point because of the China factor, et cetera. And so I looked at a couple of different possibilities that I think are interesting to think about as elements of cooperation. First of all, I think there is definitely possibilities for direct South Korean US Navy to Navy cooperation on areas that are not necessarily security related, that are not quite as provocative. As one example, humanitarian assistance disaster relief exercises 
and cooperation and planning. For all the uncertainties that we talk about in the Asia Pacific, the Indo-Asia Pacific region, the one thing we can be absolutely certain about is there are going to be natural disasters in the region. And the degree to which we think about and exercise and plan those kinds of responses to those disasters can be that much better and can be inclusive beyond those that are members of the quad and beyond, um, and also can be, again, very um, benign in regards to their response to security challenges in the region. And I think that is an area that can be done um, very productively. I think another element where there is potential for cooperation between the US, South Korea, and a broader sort of quad relationship, quad organization, is trying to um, promote and enhance the security that states um, have a difficult, some states have a difficult time maintaining in regards to um, securing maritime resources, their maritime interests, in particular in EEZ management and being able to control in particular an issue that I think is going to be increasingly important is policing um, the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing problems that are part of the broader Indo-Pacific region. And I would argue that this is more than just supporting states in a, in a sovereignty sort of issue. This is a broader important issue and interest that all states have to make sure that we have a safe, sustainable ocean economy that can continue for the benefit of all and continue to provide the food and, and resources that all states uh, rely on in that particular area. And the challenge, of course, is in particularly regions like Southeast Asia, but also the uh, islands in the South Pacific, is you have states with very large EEZs, but yet lacking the maritime and naval capabilities to be able to police those. And so what might South Korea, the United States, and a broader coalition be able to do to try to address some of those issues? I think there are a couple of possibilities. First of all, it doesn't have to be Navy to Navy cooperation. It can be at the Coast Guard level, which again is a much more benign way of bringing white hulls in as, a, as opposed to gray hull ships in some of these different um, areas. But the South Korean Coast Guard has had tremendous experience in dealing with Yellow Sea issues and illegal fishing issues along the Northern Limit Line and, and such. That expertise, that capability, along with US Coast Guard experience can be shared throughout the region and can be a way of, of helping states build expertise and perhaps some greater degree of capability through Coast Guard cooperation. Another area that South Korea has already done some work on and, and just recently in the news, um, the South Korean Navy is going to turn over a Corvette to the Philippines, um, that South Korea has done some of that already and can continue to do more of that where for a number of these countries, it's about not having the capability. As the South Korean Navy continues to grow and modernize, some of these older ships that get retired can be sold or given to some of these states that have difficulty being able to maintain control and police their exclusive economic zones. That can be a great area, not only in Southeast Asia, but also again in the South Pacific Island areas where there is a clear lack of capability. Another sort of version of that is, is I am always amazed at the, the impressive output of the South Korean shipyards. Is it possible for those shipyards to produce a very low cost type of Coast Guard cutter that could be able to be sold at a reasonable basis to, again, some of the countries who have a difficulty being able to support the capabilities that they have. That as another possibility. A third element to this is that South Korea has already shown its ability to be able to participate in some important multilateral security ventures 
two examples, UN peacekeeping operations, but also the counter piracy operation off the Horn of Africa, Combined Task Force 151. Is it possible that the United States, South Korea, perhaps through the Quad, perhaps through starting there, and perhaps with a broader multinational um, collaborative effort, to use CTF 151 as a model to help other states be able to police and protect their EEZs and defend against um, the illegal fishing operations? Certainly, this would take a lot of work, a lot of planning, and it is very definitely at the idea stage. But if it can be done for counter piracy operations, why not for one that is perhaps equally or more important as illegal fishing to have a multilateral operation for states to be able to protect these value resources? Again, not only for those individual states, but for the broader interests of a sustainable maritime um, security operation and for sustaining the importance of the fisheries in these areas. Since I'm, I'm just about running out of time, let me shift to the other area that I think is, is perhaps going to be much, much more challenging and worries me greatly, and that is Taiwan. Um, the earlier reference to the May summit between Moon and Biden was very interesting for the many different issues that were laid out. And there was a good deal of speculation that there, the United States might press South Korea to make a more official public commitment to the Quad. That didn't happen. But instead, there was an interesting line in the uh, joint communique that I think did catch many people by surprise that South Korea was willing to sign on to this. And this was the part that was part of a broader paragraph about concerns for the free and open Indo-Pacific and rules-based order that also included a line about the, quotes, importance of preserving peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Not a specific call out of China, but certainly that is implied. And very interesting that South Korea, I think, was willing to go that far. Clearly, South Korea has an important interest in maintaining peace and stability in that area because of the implications that would have for the broader regional commerce, but also a number of other areas. But here I raise some questions that I don't necessarily have any good answers for. But you know, what are the maritime implications of what South Korea might be willing to do in this alliance context. Um, was this statement in any way a specific commitment of South Korea to perhaps join in some way? Again, I'm not necessarily suggesting the South Korean Navy would be down in the Taiwan Straits, but is there some more specific element of maritime cooperation that South Korea would be willing to participate in with that? Um, or was this largely symbolic? Or was it also perhaps another way of saying South Korea will take on the lion's share of defense in the Korean Peninsula area to free up the United States to deal with what might be coming in regards to the Taiwan Straits? Let me just say that I am very worried about the future of this particular scenario and where this goes. And there are many tough decisions ahead, I think, for the United States and South Korea and the alliance in this regard. And I don't necessarily have very good answers for this. But I think these are important questions that from a maritime perspective with the alliance, that these discussions need to be beginning and that there needs to be an effort to try to answer some of these questions about what this looks like from a, an alliance perspective if Taiwan gets a lot worse than, than what it is. So let me stop there and, and turn it back over to our moderator. Thanks, Terry. You've, uh, you've again, put some, some fantastic ideas on the table. I appreciate it. Um, I was going to follow up with you on the, the Coast Guard Navy um, question there, and you've partly answered me. Um, it struck me as you were talking about potential for Coast Guard collaboration with some of the ASEAN states 
that might be something that China would react strongly to, which in turn might make it more difficult for Seoul if the government is trying to kind of tread that fine line with, between the US and China to really sort of move in the pathway and follow some of the ideas you've suggested. I can, they've obviously done so with, with the Philippines, with the Corvette. Um, can you imagine the, the, the uh, South Korea providing similar levels of support to non-US allies in ASEAN who are also claimants to South China Sea disputes? I mean, is it plausible to imagine support for Vietnam's Coast Guard from the ROC Coast Guard? And, and that is the really difficult question. And, and certainly that proposal of being able to do some of these things more broadly in countries that have South China Sea claims, that does get certainly a bit more complicated and would have to tread lightly. And there may be some reluctance to being willing to do that, certainly from some of the ASEAN states as well but also from South Korea as well. But, you know, there are ways that you can do Coast Guard collaboration and cooperation that may be less provocative. It doesn't necessarily have to be providing a, a, a significant magnitude of, of ships. It can also be personnel exchanges, cooperation, collaboration that way. And certainly depending on the state, it may have to start very small and progress. But perhaps even more right for this would be some of the South Pacific states, where I think that would be a much easier uh, lift to be able to do those things. I think the capabilities there are, are even more lacking than in some of the Southeast Asian states. Uh, but certainly any of these proposals are not easy and, and would, be, would need to be done carefully and, and cautiously. Yeah, thank you. Let me park the South Pacific uh, piece for a minute. I'd like to come back to that, but you finished with a strong um, sort of push on, on US rock collaboration in the ASEAN area and the Taiwan Strait. Professor Park mentioned um, uh, sort of uh, US rock maritime collaboration against sanctions enforcement, which we know is a problem emerging from Southeast Asia as, as the DPRK is, is getting shipments of various things coming from ports in Malaysia and Indonesia and elsewhere up through, uh, through those waters. Um, Professor Kim began by talking about how Southeast Asia is that area where BRI and the, the free and open Indo-Pacific seem to overlap. Uh, Allison mentioned again, this sort of in, in this context of US-China competition. I agree with all four of you. It seems like Southeast Asia is really um, sort of the fulcrum here. I'm very curious about a couple of questions. Uh, the first is uh, from a sort of political perspective and geopolitical perspective, to what extent does this um, US-China competition and all of the complications that that poses for governments in Seoul for governments in Washington and for allied and partnered governments in the region. How did the geopolitics affect uh, South Korea's and the US ability to operate in Southeast Asia and pursue some of the ideas that you put on the table? And then more specifically, for those of you who have the expertise, does the ROC Navy and the ROC Coast Guard have the right set of, of actual capabilities to provide uh, useful services in a quad plus type setting, to use Terry's words, in support of those allied efforts in, in Southeast Asian waters or in the Taiwan Strait? I'm just really, I don't know. And so I'm curious whether the, the, the physical assets are there for the ROC to be able to provide those sorts of services in pursuit of broader goals in the region. I'm happy yeah, to throw this back yeah. to Professor Kim first. Yeah, why don't we start with you? Uh, yes, uh, that's a, a very good question. Uh, I think uh, uh, here, Clint work, uh, emphasized uh, the Moon government uh, sign on uh, kind of uh, not a real pact, but uh, for the sake of promoting a synergistic effect between uh, Southern policy, uh, new Southern policy and, and uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, if you look at, if you look at the joint st statement of the May summit, <clears throat> between uh, President Moon and President Biden, it has a series of uh, kind of a mutual commitments in Southeast Asia. Uh, they uh, emphasized uh, ASEAN centrality, law enforcement, uh, cybersecurity, uh, public health, et cetera, et cetera. 
I think uh, why uh, President Moon uh, agreed on this uh, kind of a, a more, rather specific, uh, more specific than expected kind of, uh, uh, you know, phrases. Uh, because uh, this is my hunch. He believed uh, this kind of a cooperation would be possible within the context of uh, uh, development cooperation, like uh, South Korea providing ODA uh, to uh, empower uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, uh, to um, kind of a uh, uh, have the capability uh, to enforce uh, laws uh, or the capability to maintain kind of a maritime security uh, as Terry pointed out to uh, to protect their own EEZ. Um, this is that uh, the active commitment of uh, uh, ROK Navy itself but uh, you know, foreign ministry or the finance ministry who are in charge of uh, uh, development cooperation ODA, within that context, uh, they can provide uh, money uh, or sometimes they provide uh, some sort of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to avoid this kind of uh, uh, adjective, somewhat outdated <laughs> kind of uh, uh, Navy ships. Uh, to those countries uh, to, to uh, sustain uh, their, uh, you know, the, the development uh, to uh, kind of protect their, uh, you know, the, the territories uh, or enforcement, law enforcement activities. So this uh, is a kind of a, a detour rather than a direct uh, kind of a commitment uh, for uh, kind of a mutual uh, maritime uh, cooperation in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, I, I try to avoid uh, some direct words. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Ali, anything to add to that? And then we'll go to Professor Park and, and then back to Terry. Sure. I was just going to add that um, because you mentioned uh, how how these strategies are being impacted by the US-China competition that interestingly, Korea's emphasis on uh, the new Southern policy and kind of turn towards ASEAN in the economic realm uh, was partly a push and a factor, uh, an attempt to diversify, diversification of its economic uh, uh, partners. Uh, in the aftermath and in uh, response to the retaliation that China uh, enacted uh, for the THAAD, uh, over the THAAD dispute. So uh, this uh, attempt by China to kind of coerce and push uh, Korea to, um, to disengage a little bit from the United States and to put some uh, daylight between the US and its ally uh, in this case, uh, caused Korea to look around and say, you know, we've lost uh, a little chunk of our GDP and a huge amount of uh, economic interest over this. We need to diversify to other areas, and South Southeast Asia is was ripe. Uh, it was really great timing for for the ROK, and of course, other countries in the region have also been turning and looking to Southeast Asia to diversify their economic interests. Um, so. In that sense, um, maybe from a different perspective of how the US-China uh, rivalry has kind of impacted how countries are thinking about partnerships and their strategies in the region. Um, but to underscore um, what Dr. Kim has just said, um, it still has uh, a lot of the areas for cooperation uh, that the US has identified in those pillars that that a lot that uh, that comprise the new southern policy um, are still on the um, some of the development issues infrastructure uh, you know people to people ties uh, civil society empowerment um, these uh, kind of soft issues that are not uh, not touching some of the, the third rail um, hard security issues that would really get at uh, the, the crux of the US-China competition in that area. Thank you. Dr. Park? 
Yes, um, Alison already mentioned there's some soft issues. So I wanted to pay attention of a more hard security issue. First, um, I already mentioned that this uh, North Korean threat is very imminent and very serious to South Korea and also Japan as well. So I think uh, it is important to South Korea to pay far more attention and focus on this, our own security. And unfortunately, I think uh, you well aware that Biden administration's uh, policy toward North Korea, it seems to me they are going back to the strategic patience uh, that has been implemented by the Obama administration. As I told you that the North Korea is, uh, you know, have more advanced nuclear missiles and more have a, uh, the uh, numbers of these nuclear warheads. But so I think uh, overall the time is not our side, but uh, it seems to be the just um, Biden administration wanted to just manage this situation and not actively pursuing any kind of denuclearization of North Korea. So in that sense, we, I mean, South Korea need to pay attention to our own defense first. And um, I already mentioned that North Korea's uh, nuclear threat is not the just regional issue, but the also world agenda too. And second one is uh, more military. Think about the Taiwan Strait and Terry mentioned about the, how South Korea can uh, kind of advocate and there is something happened in the Taiwan Strait. But um, South Korea and also even the US forces in Korea, USF case, their rule is pretty much limited. You see, we are far from this uh, Taiwan Strait and South the uh, East uh, China Sea. So it is uh, not uh, military, not the appropriate to send our troops or the USFK. And the USFK, they do not have any kind of uh, asset to send uh, directly to Taiwan Strait. And most of them are the ground-based and then they are just uh, simply, uh, you know, uh, they have a readiness against North Korean's threat. And of course, we do have uh, some bases, especially Camp Humphreys in Pyeongtaek and very huge bases, but also is far away from the Taiwan Strait. So I know that military, if something happened in that area, and United States will utilize uh, US forces in Japan and some with uh, some support of the Japanese fleet, not the South Korean fleet. Of course, um, South Korean Navy, and uh, we are trying, and uh, not we, they are trying to develop the semi aircraft Korea, which I strongly oppose to that because uh, we have to pay attention about North Korean threat first. But anyway, uh, it's pretty much limited. So uh, overall, my uh, kind of suggestion or my argument is that we, I mean, South Korea need to pay attention to the North Korean threat. And that's also can um, uh, share the, some kind of responsibility burden with the United States. Thank you. Terry, anything to add to, to this? Yeah, just quickly. I mean, I think uh, Professor Park really gets it at, at an important issue of how South Korea has over the last number of years sought to balance, in my view, uh, the, the key priority of peninsula security and direct security for South Korea, but also being a contributor to broader multilateral efforts. And again, I, you know, I cite CTF uh, 151 as, as one of those, but certainly there are others as well, where South Korea, I think, has done a pretty good job of, of balancing um, the needs at home, if you will, for being a contributor to broader uh, security uh, efforts. I mean, for example, when, when South Korea began to embark on building its Blue Water Fleet, it received a good deal of criticism uh, from outside to say, why, why are you doing that? Um, you know, that's not going to necessarily help you in regards to North Korea. But I think they have been able to balance very well their shipbuilding capabilities uh, to be able to do that as well as address the North Korean threat. Um, and I think have done, done a good job. Although, you know, again, I think there are some important debates as Professor Park alluded to the aircraft carrier, uh, a nuclear powered ballistic, uh, excuse me, a nuclear powered submarine, um, another issue and, and whether those are the right ways to spend their, their money. But let me just say quickly that, that the, I think the ROC Navy is, is a very capable force. And when I look at their shipbuilding over the last number of decades and the potential uh, for them as, as they will continue that in their plans, depending on which side of the fence you are on the specific types of ships, 
is really impressive. And so I think South Korea does have the capability, at least on the Navy side. I'm a little less familiar about the Coast Guard uh, shipbuilding plans um, than I am the Navy to be able to offer some modest contributions to a broader effort. Thank you. Um, we have some great questions coming in from our audience. So I'm gonna take the liberty now of just channeling a few of those to you. Uh, Dr. Kim, we're going to start with you. Um, and the question from, from one of our uh, uh, audience members is, what are your views on China's naval modernization? Um, I mean, and this is not what the questioner is asking. I'm looking at it from my perspective and seeing increased Chinese activities uh, in the waters around some of Japan's territories, certainly massive increase in activities across the Taiwan Strait, much more assertive behavior in the South China Sea. From the perspective of Seoul, how is that um, modernization of the PLAN viewed, and, and is the, the, the ROC Navy sort of concerned about some of the capabilities that it's seeing China develop in its own naval modernization? Is there a question uh, yeah. to me? Yes. <clears throat> Chinese uh, military modernization has uh, uh, really uh, multi-dimensional implications. But if you uh, try to confine it to uh, China uh, ROK uh, relations, uh, it is uh, rather uh, limited. Uh, what we are uh, trying to uh, focus more on is uh, the Chinese so-called uh, gray zone strategy uh, in the West Sea area. Actually, this is rather unrelated to the Chinese uh, uh, military modernization. Actually, uh, what it has uh, real uh, impact uh, is kind of indirect. You know, Chinese military modernization is influencing kind of a military balance between China and the United States. And that's why the United States is, is more concerned about uh, the Chinese assertiveness and then uh, United States is, is getting more concerned about US ROK, Japanese kind of a, a trilateral security cooperation. Then uh, how uh, ROK can, uh, the current government can fit into uh, the, the, this kind of a trilateral cooperation uh, sort of things. But uh, if you uh, focus uh, that uh, issue, kind of an uh, independent uh, variable on the dependent variable of uh, uh, ROK-China relations, it, it is uh, rather uh, limited uh, in its uh, uh, impact, but uh, we probably have to be uh, more concerned about uh, the Chinese increasingly uh, sophisticated uh, gray zone strategy uh, of China. I, I look, quick follow-up for you, Dr. Kim. I, I, that, that's very um, compelling. The gray zone question is one uh, that from some other work that we've done here at NBR seems to present a, a range of challenges, especially as you think about how, you know, where do you move up the escalation ladder from a Coast Guard response to a very heavily armed Chinese uh, Coast Guard vessel in a gray zone contingency? Do you feel like the, the mechanisms are there both within the rock structure uh, and the US ROK joint forces structure to deal with those sorts of situations? Or does there need to be more collaboration and cooperation and training among the two militaries to sort of better manage those gray zone um, uh, developments when they occur? The latter, <clears throat> the latter. Actually, uh, uh, we, we tend to uh, believe uh, this gray zone strategy uh, is rather uh, the area where uh, ROK uh, should possess uh, their sole kind of a responsibility and authority uh, because this is kind of a really uh, belong to a kind of a peacetime uh, operation. But uh, this is uh, no longer the case. Uh, I, I strongly believe uh, this is the area where ROK and the United States uh, uh, should cooperate with each other. Uh, to, to enforce laws, uh, but also uh, to maintain uh, maritime security uh, on this part of the world. Thank you. Um, Professor Park, let me come to you next with another question from the audience. Um, 
And it, it's really, I think, exploring some of the ideas you mentioned in, in your opening remarks. Um, you rightfully corrected me, my, uh, my clumsy use of war games as opposed to military exercises. But then you made a very strong case for, um, you know, a much more clarity in terms of extended deterrence and, and, and US deployment of, of nuclear weapons to the peninsula or around the peninsula if needs be. Uh, my, the question from the audience member is, um, would those sorts of steps be seen purely as defensive? Or is that kind of um, uh, sort of escalation that you're describing or the development that you're describing really playing into more of an arms race that would be emerging on the peninsula? Sorry, Michael, I, I have to correct you one more time. There is, a, <laughs> there is no arms race on the Korean Peninsula, period. Because South Korea, we have every legitimate right to defend ourselves. Is uh, you know the, no country and no international law prohibit the South Korean's military buildup, but on the other hand, North Korea has every move to build their own arms, especially missiles, definitely violation of all sanctions, United Nations security sanctions, including 17, 18, and all the series of sanctions. So, you know, I think uh, North Korea is uh, intentionally bring this so-called double dealing or double standard to make uh, all their, their the weapon development as a legitimate one. Since September, the Kim Jong-un's uh, daughter, uh, Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yajong, and publicly mentioned that South Korea and United States and international community should stop to raise questions about North Korea's uh, legitimate military buildup. They are saying that it's not different from the South Korean mil military buildup, such as we have a, the mid-year plan of the, the uh, military buildup. So, and then they said that stop to applying this double standard, double dealing. Is there in that, uh, if we just follow their logic and then we have to accept North Korea as a legitimate the, uh, nuclear state because we can raise and we can criticize anything about their nuclear missile development. So we have to be very careful that we shouldn't bring this framework of the arms kind of race on the Korean Peninsula. And, um, yeah, and they are purely defensive. Yes, of course, South Korea, we don't have any intention to have, a, you know, to threat the neighboring country. We've been threatened by the neighboring country. And um, we have a very serious direct threat from the North Korea. So defensive posture is a very important. But at the same time, this our incumbent, the government, Moon Jae-in government is trying to be a little bit more independent from this United States. You see, we the South Korean government and they are put the uh, you know, huge emphasis on the inter-Korean relations. So in that sense, all their the foreign policy, external policies are pretty much based on the so-called Uri Minjokiri, that's our nation, nation first. So that's the uh, some kind of a little bit worried some uh, policy from the, my own perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Terry, the next question is coming to you, um, and it's really asking you to unpack a little bit more one of the, the comments you made in your remarks. Um, these sort of quad plus or other mini lateral configurations where you can imagine uh, South Korea collaborating with the US. I, I, and I, you've given some great examples in your remarks about specific instances where you could see that happening, whether it's phishing or, or HEDR. Um, my, I guess my question would be, what are the other natural partnerships? I mean, is it a, a US, ROK, Australia configuration? Um, can we imagine in the, in the foreseeable future an effective US, Korea, Japan configuration, given some of the, the tensions between the two US allies in Northeast Asia? What's the prospect for US, ROK, India collaboration? Give us a little bit more detail on some of those multilaterals that you could see emerging as, as this quad plus um, uh, framework sort of takes hold. Sure, let me start with the one that will not happen, at least not in the near term, and that is the Korea-Japan-US uh, collaboration. I think that given the circumstances, that is going to be very difficult, and we are some years away from that possibility, much to my sadness. I, I, I hope that can be worked on in the years ahead, but of course, as everyone on this this event knows it is difficult and complicated. Um, but I think as, as you mentioned, um, it can start small, but I think it can, can grow to be um, a much broader multilateral sort of, of effort. So a US-India 
um, South Korea relationship, um, even perhaps uh, some countries from Southeast Asia, but as well with, with the British uh, seeming to demonstrate an increased interest in being involved in the Indo-Pacific area. Uh, would France be interested um, after we get past a few more uh, months of, of unhappiness? I, you know, I think there are a number of other partners that would be willing to join some sort of a broader multinational coalition that might start small, but could be an even broader effort to address some of these. I think, again, it, it is hard to not argue that these are broad global issues of maintaining a sustainable maritime ecosystem and um, marine uh, economy. Those things I think you could get broad um, European Union uh, participation as well. Uh, Germany um, might be interested in something like that as well, perhaps on a, on a less regular basis. But I think there's, there's a lot of potential for that to perhaps start with a two, three, four country sort of effort and then expand. Great, thank you. Um, and I know we're, we're coming up on time. So Alison, last question from the audience to you, uh, just a couple, three minutes if you could on this, and then we'll, uh, we'll move to our conclusion here. Um, you mentioned in your remarks, um, on the one hand, there's continuity between the Trump administration's sort of free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and a lot of what the Biden administration has begun to signal in terms of its initial priorities. Um, we've seen some of that flow through in the Global Posture Review. Obviously, a very different tone and style, and especially in terms of how the US is going to work with, um, with allies and partners. Uh, the big change that, that, that I certainly see and, and our audience members are seeing um, was the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was very abrupt, which attracted a lot of criticism both within the US and, and among some allies and partners. And I'm curious, um, as you look at that situation, I mean, it's obviously a decision that was taken under the Trump administration, executed under the Biden administration. How has that shock, if it has been a shock, affected some of these US goals toward the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy? How has that withdrawal from Afghanistan affected some of the alliance relationships that uh, Washington is currently trying to really uh, build up in, in the context of this competition with China? So I think that there's a kind of two components to this. There's the question of how um, the U.S. involvement in Afghanistan and now uh, with that withdrawal of that involvement, um, how that uh, affects the U.S. Uh, attention and ability to focus on the key challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so that's a part of it. And then the second piece is how um, the withdrawal itself was managed, how that um, has uh, played out amongst allies and partners and whether it has shaken any credibility. Um, so for the first piece, you know, I think that uh, if we go back to the Bush administration, uh, when we saw the United States begin to really turn its focus and acknowledge that the then Asia Pacific uh, region was going to be the most dynamic and also most strategically important region. Uh, we saw the United States begin to make that shift and then of course 9-11 happened and getting drawn into uh, different conflicts in the Middle East uh, over the next you know, decade plus, two decades uh, has kind of sapped some of the resources and certainly uh, strategic attention away from uh, focusing on the region and as it has now evolved into the challenge uh, of uh, competition with China. So from that perspective, withdrawing from Afghanistan, uh, you know, frees, uh, hypothetically frees up resources and certainly uh, allows the United States to focus on the issues and uh, the challenges that are going to define the next decade and uh, really beyond. Um, so in the broader context, uh, I think that it's something that was initiated under the Trump administration. The Biden administration 
um, you know, executed and followed through on it, but also was interested in seeing that happen so that that attention shift and that focus could, could happen. Um, as far as the impact of how the withdrawal uh, was carried out on um, US partners, allies, others in the region, um, on their perceptions of the United States. I think there was a lot of bluster, a lot of uh, initial outcry that it was going to ruin and destroy American credibility in the region. Um, but I think that uh, in reality, we haven't seen uh, very much of that play out. And when you look at the types of relationships, um, we have you know, mutual defense treaties with uh, our allies. It's quite a different uh, situation. We still have extended deterrence um, for, for our allies in the region. Um, those commitments are not really impacted, I think, by the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, it's not a good look for America in the world, but I don't think it um, has really destroyed credibility in the way that some were concerned that it would. All right. Um, Dr. Kim, a quick hand raise from you. If you could just a, a minute, 90 seconds max, please, for your remarks here. Uh, before closing, uh, let me uh, make uh, a kind of a few suggestions to the, the, the U.S. Uh, first of all, as I already pointed out, uh, we need to uh, increase our uh, cooperation to deal with uh, the Chinese gray zone strategy in the uh, West Sea. That's number one. And also, uh, we need to uh, increase our cooperation uh, on ODA uh, for Southeast Asia. Uh, to, to empower uh, their capability to deal with the many challenges on the sea. Uh, you know, third, uh, we didn't uh, talk about ADMM plus, uh, which includes uh, many uh, ASEAN dialogue partners, uh, even uh, that uh, include uh, China uh, for the sake of uh, reducing uh, unnecessary Chinese suspicion, I think that we need to accelerate uh, this kind of a cooperation, uh, ADMM uh, plus. Uh, this is also focused on uh, Southeast uh, Asia. And finally, Terry mentioned uh, the, the Quad uh, plus or other uh, activities in the uh, midst of uh, some, some uh, you know, the, the arguments uh, about the future of Quad. Uh, I think uh, the most realistic way uh, is, is uh, to create uh, working groups of Quad uh, rather than uh, directly talking about Quad Plus. Uh, as you know, uh, we have uh, the pandemic work working group and the climate change working group and the new, the new uh, emerging technology working groups. I think uh, the, the, the ROK government is ready to join the first two, uh, but a little bit reluctant to join the third working group uh, on emerging technologies. Uh, I don't know why, but uh, we, we have to uh, join that uh, working group too. Uh, but at the same time, the United States needs to uh, take the leadership role to increase more working groups like uh, maritime security, uh, you know, some other, uh, the, you know, the, the, uh, the areas uh, for kind of a regional cooperation. This kind of a step-by-step -step kind of a, a, a approach uh, would be more realistic. But that, that, that is my uh, quick suggestion. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, I would like to thank on behalf of our audience, all four of you for fantastic presentations, wonderful answers. We could have kept going for a lot longer, but it's nice to finish with some very solid recommendations about next steps. Um, I'm now going to take this opportunity to turn to my colleague, uh, NBR's president, Roy Kamphausen, to initiate the conclusion of today's discussion. Roy, over to you. Thanks so much, Michael, and thanks to this great panel and to our audience members for your contributions to a terrific discussion. Uh, for our audience, the video recording of this event will be made available on the NBR website by tomorrow. Uh, I'd like to add some concluding thoughts on the importance of US ROK naval collaboration for promoting peace and stability in the Western Pacific. But first, Chairman Zhang, let me express our gratitude at NBR for the opportunity to partner with your great institution, the Korean Institute for Maritime Strategy. It's been a real treat. I look forward to a long and prosperous relationship. 
US-China's strategic competition in the maritime domain presents a major challenge for the Republic of Korea as it continues to hedge against while simultaneously carefully managing relations with China, at the same time maintaining a strong alliance with the United States. This is a difficult and intricate uh, challenge for the ROK. Now, territorial disputes and illegal fishing are two specific maritime issues between China and the ROK, and these raise the chances of, of even armed confrontation between the two countries. These challenges are particularly problematic given China's use of gray zone tactics below the level of armed conflict, as well as was noted during our discussion, the increasing use of a, an ever more militarized Chinese Coast Guard. Now responding to these challenges could be an area for collaboration as we've discussed for the Alliance for US ROK Naval Cooperation, especially as the US highlights uh, important features of the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. As my colleague Ali Sawinski said earlier, the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy prioritizes engagement with American local partners and highlights the trust that the United States places in its allies, including the Republic of Korea, even in the midst of complex geopolitical environments, such as we, what we see in Northeast Asia. Now, developing peaceful relationships with North Korea through the support of ROK confidence building measures in the maritime domain is an example of how maritime issues can influence security postures. But North Korea's continued hostility in the maritime domain, as we've discussed this evening, including the, the killing last year of an ROK fisheries official, further challenges ROK and US naval cooperation, uh, as Professor Pak has, has described. Even so, the Inter-Korean Comprehensive Military Agreement signed in 2018, which called for a peace zone that extends into the sea around the border between North and South Korea. This framework that the ROK and DPRK governments are working within could be a place in which the United States supports South Korean confidence building measures with North Korea. And while the US and ROK are actively collaborating on a variety of maritime issues in Northeast Asia, Perhaps one of the strongest identifiers of the strength and breadth of the US ROK alliance is US ROK cooperation outside of the Korean Peninsula region or, or Northeast Asia more generally. As Dr. Rorig has discussed, the United States and South Korea's naval collaboration is no longer limited just to the Western Pacific. ROK naval vessels have joined the US in anti piracy and other operations in the Indian Ocean, for instance. And this has demonstrated not only the shared interest in security of the Korean Peninsula, but speaks to the depth of the US and ROK shared interests and values, especially support for the rule of law and democracy, so that the two countries can effectively protect and promote through a collaborative endeavor. Today's event is an embodiment of the kinds of partnerships that support the US ROK alliance, both at the policy level as well as in the field or on the sea. This event could not have been possible without the work of Korea Institute for Maritime Strategy researchers, Seung Mo Kang and Sang Hoon Kim. Sang Hoon was a, formerly a Korea Foundation Research Fellow at NBR. And so it's a delight to see him and work with him again. And I'm also grateful for the work of my NBR colleagues, Melanie Berry and Olivia Truesdale to make today's event possible. Special thanks to our speakers, Chung Sung, Kim Sung Han, Ali Sawinski, Park Mongan, and Terry Rurig, as well as our moderator and my colleague, Michael Wills. With that, I now want to turn things over to Mr. Chung Sung Nam to wrap up the event. Captain Chung is a retired ROK Naval officer and currently works as the director of the Maritime Security Center at the Korean Institute for Maritime Strategy. While he was on active duty, he commanded combat patrol and fast attack ships and was also devoted to combat development and strategy development at the Naval Forces Development Command. He taught military and maritime strategy at the Rock Naval War College as well. Captain Chung, over to you. Okay, thank you for a kind introduction, Yvonne, that's at the end of this question. 
Uh, let me give a concrete remarks. With a very uh, short chain. Uh, I believe uh, the discussion we have is really, really good and important because uh, we can learn a lot uh, from this discussion. But uh, I felt uh, this discussion uh, have left, left us with a lot of questions we need to address further, even into next year. That's another reason we need to continue this dialogue uh, to answer the question that was implied by uh, this discussion. I, I want to thank you so much for uh, all the participants, uh, even uh, you know, the working at officers for uh, organizing and for uh, making this event happen. I, I believe this was a really uh, resounding, resounding success. Thank you so much. Bye.